So about Salatin, you say in the chapter on utopian beef, uh, importantly, and now this goes maybe away from the question about, the pure question about can we kill animals or not, and more to kind of questions about efficiency and scalability, you say, look, you know, he's got these great ratios, one cow per acre of grass or whatever in his pasture raised system. And he does have some pretty impressive results that he gets out of his polyculture and his um, rotational methods and all that sort of thing. Um, but you point out that, uh, as you say, the land requirements beyond the idyll of Swope, Virginia are less than Swope-like. In fact, they are, as grass farmers themselves are often the first to admit, comparatively dreadful. So the thought is, in a way, sometimes these alternative approaches, in the class we're calling it the Ithaca response, in part because there's a lot of people around here who are trying to do it. And when Salatin came, we had something like 100, 150 farmers show up for his talk out of the blue. It somehow had gone around on some listservs, which was exciting um, and interesting. But there's a lot of people trying to do that, and I think you're right to say that some of the homesteaders and others are finding out that his results uh, are pretty viable in the Shenandoah Valley, but that they're hard to replicate elsewhere. So what do you say to somebody who thinks, you know, look, as long as we stopped keeping our lawns and replaced our, our household pets with chickens and did some ur more urban agriculture and used a lot of that open space and tried some of Salatin's methods, we could actually develop both plants and animals uh, in the amounts that we would need to have a decent and healthy alternative agriculture system. Well, let's begin with the question of scalability and replicability, yeah. because I think this is really uh, a core problem for a lot of these alternatives. They might work very well in a microclimate or a certain you know location like uh, Salatin's farm in Virginia. And yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're right, Salatin does a very good job achieving this kind of cycle, although he does import, um, you know, as I write in the book, lots of feed from uh, to feed his chickens from who knows where probably the midwest i yeah. think he says it's scanic feed but you know it's not as closed as he makes it seem this is not something that he readily advertises well so he I admitted it though we asked him about it and we said that you had mentioned it in the book and he was like yeah that's right that's right so he admitted it well no i'm yeah he yeah. admits it when asked yeah um, and, but when you go and tour his farm or he's not going to let this be known and i think it's pretty important to note that, you know, this guy is the guru. If he's the one who's doing it better than anybody else and he cannot even achieve the kind of cycle that he promotes, yeah. we should be achieving, I think that raises a red flag. But more importantly, the fact that he has a one cow to one acre ratio um, is, 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 is very misleading because if you come to Texas, you know, where I am, uh, the grass fed farmers here just shake their heads. They might have 100 acres per cow. I mean, we don't have the kind of grasslands, uh, they're not nearly as fertile as Joel Salatin has. And you can make the argument that if you graze the cattle property, the grasslands will come back, mm -hmm. but you need water for that, and we're in a drought. And you see what happens when you decentralize these systems. They are very difficult to create any sort of hum homogeneity there, and therefore very difficult to make any sweeping judgments about at all. Mm -hmm. I listened to a lot of farmers, and I mainly went into a lot of like grass-fed chat rooms where farmers talk to each other about the problems that they're having, and many of them kind of held up Salatin and said over and over again, yeah, but we can never do this, no mm -hmm. matter how knowledgeable we were, no matter how well educated we were, because the climatic conditions do not allow us to right. achieve the efficiencies that Salatin achieves. Now, Salatin turns around and says, well, it's just about becoming a better farmer. It's just about management. And I'm really dubious of that. And the analogy that I come up with is if you put me in a, you know, a room with a dartboard and turned off the lights and said, throw this dart, um, I'm going to miss it most of the time. If I kept doing it over and over and over again, I might develop a kind of intuition and hit it every now and then. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, it's going to be fairly difficult to do. And that's actually how I look at uh, grass-fed farming, or at least grass-fed farming done well <laughs> in terms of managing these nutrients. Yeah. Now, what I just said there took a long time to say, and right. it involves a lot of nuances and qualifications. And so what happens is the media gets a hold of it, and doesn't go into any of that because it takes up too much space, it's boring, and it's um, full of qualifications that are a little distracting. But, you know, to me, that's the real story. And I think that's what's not getting told as we talk about um, uh, grass-fed beef. The other sort of problem that I have with Salatin's approach, and this gets into some of Alan Savory's work, so yeah. I don't 
want to uh, jump the gun too much here, but this whole idea of being able to replicate ancient relationships yeah. between yeah. ungulates and grasslands strike me strikes me as as one of the most environmentally arrogant thoughts that that we can possibly entertain. And on some level, that is what you know people like Salazar is trying to do is to sort of replicate a level of biodiversity that I think works very well on the rhetorical level. But if you actually start thinking about um, the reality of replicating ancient relationships when we have nine billion people, or going to have nine billion people yeah. in the world, um, I just become confused as to how that could ever be realistic, realistically achievable.